Uh, thank you to the apologies. Thank you to the Echo Platform for uh, allowing us to host these meetings. Um, this evening, we will be talking about hepatocellular carcinoma. We'd like to show a few cases uh, from our unit that we've seen in the last few months. Um, and um, we've got Prof Hale on, uh, who'll be guiding us through the histology samples. And um, Prof Hale, when you're happy, um, I can start uh, with the first case. Please, 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 please do, Dylan. Um, so, Prof, the first gentleman is Mr. D.W. Um, he is a Nash cirrhotic. Um, he um, was seen for the first time uh, decompensated uh, with septicemia, uh, thought to be due to a pneumonia. Uh, was noted to have ascites, esophageal varices, um, and on imaging was um, noted to have multiple. Uh, initially on the sonar reported as innumerable hepatic lesions on uh, MRI liver with primavist uh, was shown to have at least three um, concerning Lariat's five lesions and um, with invasion of a segmental portal vein and obstruction of a segmental bile duct um, and a liver biopsy was per performed to confirm the diagnosis as his alpha fetoprotein was non-specific at about 30. Prof, over to you. Yeah, yeah. okay, are there any questions maybe from the, uh, from the audience, from those that have yeah, booked in. Okay, so it seems no questions. All right, so let's uh, let's have a look. So this then is the histology, and uh, you should see. Can everybody see that screen? Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay, so what we've got then is um, a pretty typical uh, picture that we see with these tumors. And um, if we look just under low power, you can see that the, that the morphology of all these is exactly the same. There's sheets and sheets of tumor cells. Uh, it's a fragmented biopsy, which is quite typical because there is no substance that is holding the, the tumor together. So remember, for example, in, the, in, in normal liver, You've got the reticulum framework, uh, the fibrous connective tissue associated with the portal tracts, the central veins, all those structures uh, add, if you like, a foundation uh, to the parenchyma of the liver, and they hold it all together when it's biopsied. But when you have a tumor, often what happens, in fact, is that you get this uh, fragmentation uh, of the biopsy. So that's usually quite a good clue, in fact, that, uh, that you're dealing with, uh, with a neoplastic process. It's not always, uh, it's a, it's, but it's, it's a soft uh, criterion. The other thing that sometimes happens in patients with cirrhosis, also because of these cirrhotic nodules and the, and the fibrous connective tissue that, um, that forms around the regenerating nodules, often you get fragmentation occurring along those fibrous connective tissue bands as well. So by, by and large, an intact liver biopsy uh, is, uh, is, is often a, a good sign. Uh, whereas uh, uh, as, a, as a fragmented biopsy is often indicative of underlying pathology. Right, so let's have a look at this. So what we've got here then is um, a picture of, uh, of hepatocytes. You can see that uh, we've got a variable uh, component of cells, and we've got cells with uh, somewhat cleared cytoplasm, such as you see here, just focus this a little bit more. So cells with cleared cytoplasm, alternating with the areas of cells or foci of cells that have got um, or is in the cytoplasm. And you can see that uh, we've got this trabecular growth pattern. And in some areas, there's also a pseudoglandular pattern, as you see there towards the bottom right-hand um, corner of the screen. Now, if the pseudoglandular pattern is, um, is prominent, uh, then uh, one can easily go down 
the mistaken road of calling it a, a, a metastatic adenocarcinoma. So one has to be very careful, in fact, that you're not missing a pseudoglandular paracellular carcinoma. And if you look here, you can see that there are other glandular areas. So I've pointed out that one there. But if you look there, you can see a pseudoglandular area. And then as your eyes become accustomed to that, you can see glandular spaces there, another one there, and another one there, and another one there probably another one there. So this would be a mixed pattern where you've got a trabecular growth pattern and also what we call a pseudoglandular pattern. Now, the other thing that I want to draw your attention to is the um, presence of um, sinusoidal-like spaces. And if you look at this area here, you can see that you've got these spaces and these mimic the sinusoids in, uh, in, in the normal liver. But they're not normal sinusoids in the strict sense of the word. What they are, in fact, is endothelial line spaces. And you'll recall that in the liver, the sinusoids are not lined by endothelial cells, but lined by sinusoidal lining cells. And um, the immunohistochemistry uh, profile of these particular cells is that of they are CD34 positive, which helps one make the diagnosis, particularly if you've got a well differentiated bacillular carcinoma. Now, the other thing that I'd just like to draw your attention to as well is the thickness of these trabeculae. You can see that uh, we've got probably half a dozen cells uh, across that trabeculum, and we would call this a macro trabecular hepatocellular carcinoma. And I think that uh, looking at it, um, once you've seen a few of these, it's a relatively easy diagnosis to make uh, just on H&E. Now, the other thing that happens as well in a paracellular carcinoma, if you're lucky, and I must stress if you're lucky, is the presence of intracellular bile. And uh, down here, if I can find it, there is intracellular bile. I just checked again, it's short. It's, yeah, there's a second got as well. Right, so what I picked up on this dot here was the pseudoglandular pattern. And here you can see these numerous glandular spaces with the cells outlining the spaces. And you can see that they are almost true glands it's not a pseudo, it's a, we call it pseudoglandular because a paracellular carcinoma is not an adenocarcinoma. Um, but you can see well deformed pseudoglandular structures. And notice once again the eosinophilic cytoplasm and cells with more abundant cleared cytoplasm, which is a feature of HCC. Now I mentioned to you that if you're lucky, you can also find bile in these cells. And if we look at this here, we can see that we've got intracellular bile, for example, that cell there. And uh, some of, there is also a bile in the intracanalicular pattern, that's intracanalicular there. And for example, I think here you can see this greenish brown tinge, uh, which is characteristic of intracellular bile. So that's a dead giveaway. And uh, the reason why it's, it's important to look for that is because a paracellular carcinoma can occur in some funny sites. And yes, you know, we're used to paracellular carcinomas uh, and one would expect obviously to find them in the liver. But sometimes metastatic paracellular carcinoma uh, does occur in patients and you can get subcutaneous masses. Uh, you can get um, masses in other organs and uh, you can even get to paracellular carcinoma in the bone marrow. And um, it is the clues such as this here, uh, if you find bile in those, that enable you to make a diagnosis without going on a long, elaborate goose chase or wild goose chase, trying to find out what the origin of the tumor is. Um, and you can spend a lot of money with things like immunohistochemistry uh, if, you, if you don't see this. So the finding then of intracellular bile is particularly useful. So I was very happy that this was an HCC. And oh, sorry, the other thing just to 
point out are these prominent nucleoli that I've just seen, quite characteristic of liver cells. And I think you would agree, uh, for those of you who have seen hepatocellular carcinomas and, and also liver, that it looks typically like liver. But unfortunately, patients don't always read the textbooks, as we know too well. And this is the reticulin stain. And uh, I phoned, um, when I phoned uh, uh, the physician concerned, I said, this is an, an HCC. I did it before, uh, before I received the specials. And one of the features of a paracellular carcinoma is that there's a marked paucity of reticulin. And if we look here, we can see these reticulin fibers. They are fragmented and they're relatively sparse, but nevertheless, they are there. And this was of a bit of a concern because usually you in fact want to see an absence or a complete absence of reticulin. So there's an example where you've got much more reticulin uh, preserved. And when you see this, you know, we as histopathologists get a little bit concerned because we do like our cases to to read the textbooks. And as fortunately, as I said, they don't always. So this is an abnormal finding. But we do know that there is a, that there is a number of patients with HCC where you don't get preservation of the reticulum like, you, like you, um, uh, you see. So here, for example, you can see the reticulin is relatively preserved, whereas in the left, left upper part of this field, you can see that there's paucity of reticulin. So I think it's quite happy, I would be quite happy that this is an HCC, but uh, certainly from, from a completeness point of view, it would be good to see a complete absence of reticulin. Now we do immunistic you know, chemistry, uh, as you know, and uh, we have a saying that, um, you know, if you do special stains and carcinomas, but it's also expressed in cirrhotic nodules, so it's not absolute. You can't use immunohistochemistry as a, um, uh, what's the word, as a, as a diagnostic tool, uh, as a primary diagnostic tool. You can only really use it as a supportive diagnostic tool. So glutamine synthetase, for example, can be positive in cirrhotic nodules. It can also be positive in focal nodular hyperplasias and also in hepatitis. So one has to be very careful. You always got to read the immunistic chemistry in the context in which you're using. So here in this particular instance, you can see that we've got diffuse cytoplasmic positivity. It's strong positivity. And I think that certainly fits the diagnosis of a paracillium that passes Now the other one is, is the glypican-3. And glypican-3 is a useful marker. It's relatively specific. I say relatively because you can also get positive staining in, th in things such as non seminomatous germ cell tumors uh, and a number of other uh, situations as well. But here, for example, you've got also uh, focal staining, cytoplasmic staining for glutamine syn synthetase. You can see that there, nicely demonstrated. But the problem with glutamine synthetase staining is it can be patchy. And this is an example of that patchiness. So here you've got positive staining, but in the upper half of the field, it's completely negative. And if you're unlucky enough to get a tumor that looks like that, then you don't have any immunohistochemistry to, to fall back on. And it can be quite a problematic diagnosis uh, to make. You can see, for example, that that is all negative. That is all negative. And in fact, the majority of this tumor, if I go under low power, uh, is in fact, um, just, oh, 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 hold on a sec, sorry. Right, sorry about that interruption. I've just got a couple of parallel problems that I've got to sort out. Okay, so. As I was saying, so if we look under low power, we can see that the majority of these uh, biopsies are in fact chromic, at least are, um, are negative for glycan 3. So the positivity rate 
if I remember correctly, for GLAPCAN3, uh, in hepatocellular carcinomas is of the order of sort of 60 to 70 percent. So it's not as high as, as one would like. Now I want to, lastly, before we leave this case, is to look at the CD34 positivity. And if you look at CD34 positivity, we've done a CD34 on this, and you can see that uh, the tumor shows good staining of those sinusoidal-like spaces. You can see all that there. So this is quite typical then of HCC. You would not get the staining pattern in the sinusoids of normal liver. They would be CD34 negative. So in summary, then, this is an example of a trabecular uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And potentially, it's a, a relatively well-differentiated uh, tumor. It doesn't really change the prognosis much, uh, as, as, you've, as, as you've heard, Dr. Bob, we say there was invasion of the, uh, there was venous invasion, so the prognosis uh, would be guarded in this particular patient. But I think it's a pretty good example then of a typical uh, paracellular carcinoma. Turn it over to you. Thank you, Prof. Um, unfortunately, it was also found to have suspicious lung nodules um, at the time. Um, but moving on to the next case, uh, we've got Mr. K.N., a 45-year-old gentleman, had a two-year history of hypertension, well-controlled on a single agent, um, presented to his local doctors in, uh, presented to his local doctors with a two-month history of right upper quadrant pain. Um, basic imaging of his abdomen was performed, which revealed a four by three centimeter lesion in his liver, and this was followed up with higher resolution imaging, which revealed a four and a half by three and a half centimeter Lyreds 5 lesion, which included the portal vein. Also, um, there was a suspicion of a malignant porta hepatis lymph node. However, his alpha fetoprotein was three. Um, in his workup, he was found to have occult hepatitis B with a surface antigen negative, surface antibody negative, but core total positive, and a low positive viral load of 178. Um, it did not have any other features of established portal hypertension on imaging, did not have any varices on endoscopy, and um, relatively preserved uh, fully preserved albumin, INR, and bilirubins. Um, a biopsy was done at the referral center, which unfortunately was initially reported as adenocarcinoma, and thus we sent it to proper review. Thanks, then. Are there any questions about the previous case or the history on the current case? Okay, so let's uh, let's do this one. So um, what I'm going to do is do something that I usually ask the registrars to do often. So I'm going to go back to the previous case. And... Maybe it's a little unfair. Um, now, it probably is a little unfair. But what I'd like you to do is just to take in your mind a photograph of those cells in your mind. OK, so just have a look at, at those cells in your mind. OK. Notice some of these cells are clear, the eosinophilic cytoplasm. So that's the previous case. So now we're going to go to the current case. And when we go to the current case, you can see that we've got multiple portions of tissue. You can see that we've got fragmentation. And what I'd like you to do is compare the photograph that you've just taken of the previous case 
and compare it to those. And I think you'll agree that there is some similarity. There's a slight difference in that there are there is a greater number of cells with cleared cytoplasm, but you can see these cells here with more eosinophilic cytoplasm are relatively abundant. And you can also see that some of these cells have relatively conspicuous nucleoli. You can see that there's a pseudoglandular pattern. So for example, here, you can see the pseudoglandular pattern there. And falling apart a little bit, and I think you'll agree that that's a bit of a pseudo gland there, an attempt at gland formation. And then I mentioned that when, when these biopsies fall apart, that tends to suggest that there's pathology. And if we look here, you can see that these spaces are not falling apart, but these in fact are, um, are sinusoidal-like regions. So there's one there, there's another one here. This is an artifact, this is truly falling apart, but this is not. You can see there's some sort of continuity in, in the cells. And there again, that's a pretty good sinusoidal-like area. You can see that there. These are these prominent endothelial cells. So this then is another example of hepatocellular carcinoma. It's pseudoglandular, it's also trabecular. So we're gonna go backwards and forwards now uh, to, uh, to, as I show you different parts of this particularly interesting tumor. So this then is the glycan 3 And this is strongly positive. And if you compare that, this staining characteristic to the previous one, where it is relatively patchy, here you've got absolutely undoubted strong cytoplasmic positivity in all the tumor. Unfortunately, the tumor has been cut away a bit uh, because of the repeated attempts of going back to the block, but you can see this is strongly positive. Deep, dark, uh, brown cytoplasmic staining and you can see that um, the uh, nuclei are negative. So that's classic glycan 3 positivity. And then if we look at the, if we look at the uh, glutamine synthetase, it is also positive. Okay, so good going cytoplasmic positivity in these cells. Once again, classic example. And then if we look at the CD34, so these are the tumor fragments here. And you can see that you've got good CD34 positivity as well. So quite happy to say that this is a hepatocellular carcinoma. But as I said, the patients don't always read the books. And you can see there's lots of tumor. That's more tumor there. And what I want to do is I want to go back to the h &E. And if we go back to the h &E, we can see that there are other changes that are present. The first thing I want to concentrate on is the obvious, and that is the bile ducts. If you look at these bile ducts, you can see that they are irregular in outline. You've got this uh, rather angulated appearance to them. Uh, there seems to be a bit of clustering of these bile ductular structures as well. And then when we look at them in more detail, one gets the idea that there is loss of polarity. In other words, the nuclei are not lining up. Excuse me, there seems to be a little bit of a cribriform architecture developing here. And there is also variation in the uh, size of the nuclei. You can see you've got some big nuclei, and then you've got smaller nuclei down here. Now, we talk about the rule of four, that when you diagnose cholangiocarcinoma 
Auckland's carcinoma in situ, you want to see a fourfold variation in nucleus size. And I'm not sure that this reaches a fourfold variation in nuclear size, but certainly I think that in some cells we've probably got a threefold variation in size. But certainly these are not normal biotypes, and um, that is of concern. Now also, if we look at this, we can see that there are other ductular structures that have really unusual cytological appearances. So for example, you've got this duct here, and compared to this here, where you've got sort of washout of these biliary epithelial cells, we're losing biliary epithelial cell nuclei. We've got this pleomorphism and hyperchromatism. We've got attenuation of the biliary epithelium. All very concerning features. And then when we look elsewhere, we start to see that there's quite marked and forward bioductular proliferation. So for example, down here, we can see that we've got all these proliferating bioductuals, lots of angulation, the cytological changes uh, continue through. And this is abnormal, this sort of picture, to see the cellular pleomorphism and hyperchromatism. You can see this epithelial attenuation, you can see the variation in the nuclear size, and you've also got the beginnings of a bit of desmoplastic stroma in the portal tract. So the question then arises, could this be a combined hepatocellular cholangiocarcinoma? And I think the answer to that is, it probably is. So how are we going to prove that? Well, unfortunately, it's rather difficult on this particular biopsy because of the, of the fragmentation. But nevertheless, um, hopefully I can demonstrate why uh, we think it is that. So here, for example, you can see a very abnormal looking proliferating bile duct. That's not a normal proliferating bile duct. You can see the cellular, that is the nuclear pleomorphism, the hyperchromatism, and yeah, look at the size of that nucleus compared to the size of that nucleus. So now what we're going to do is we'll look at the, um, at the CK7. And the CK7 is a marker, cytokeratin 7 is a marker of biliary proliferation and uh, biliary differentiation. So these are those areas there. And you can see, for example, that we've got tumor here. So this is going back to the original portion of the tumor. And if you look at this here, you can see that there are cells that are exhibiting cytokeratin 7 positivity. And uh, um, Dinan and Bilal uh, and Chris, uh, we were on the meeting earlier together. Uh, where we were discussing that particular patient with a paracellular carcinoma and an elevated uh, CA199, as I recall. And I think I showed you uh, areas of that particular tumor that were also CK7 positive. positive. And it's very similar to this particular instance here. And then when we move down here, we can see that that CK7 positivity, now this is these are in areas which were clearly HCC, that CK7 positivity is stronger. And then likewise, down here, where you've got good going CK7 positivity uh, in the, uh, the typical hepatocellular areas. Um, if I go back to the, uh, to the picture, so the CD34 then, let's go back to the seven. So just matching the areas. So we've got this area here and I'm going to show you. Um, so these are the CK7 areas there of the hepatocellular tumor. And then this is the same area with the CD34.
this is the same area here. As you can see, it's come out a little bit better. This shoot-like growth pattern and what we've got is strong CD34 positivity. So that suggests then that this is a combined paracellular carcinoma, cholangiocarcinoma. So over to you, Dylan. So Martin, there's a question, if I may. Sorry, Dinan. Sure. Uh, so the question is, um, do you, from Omaladi Vitiku, would you, do you always do immunohistochemistry to make the diagnosis? So there, are there any situations where you'd be so confident on um, H&E that you wouldn't, I know you do them routinely, but Say you didn't have them, would you would you be confident enough on an H and E ever to make the diagnosis of HCC? So, so Chris, I mean, that, that's that's a very good question, and the answer is yes. Um, I think you've got a picture where it looks like a paracellular carcinoma, and you've got paucity of the reticulant framework, then I certainly would not do immunohistochemistry on those. Yeah, Calangio? Uh, Cholangiocarcinoma, now that's a, that's a completely different uh, story. The diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma is exceedingly difficult um, because you're dealing, with, you're dealing with proliferating bile ducts that even when they are benign, look as though they are invasive in the, in the portal tract. And the problem with, with cholangiocarcinoma is you get a field effect. So uh, you can have a cholangiocarcinoma, uh, for example, in the pancreas, uh, but you could also have, or in the, in the common bile duct, but you could also have abnormal changes in the biliary tree with with, within the liver. So that, that is a problematic diagnosis. And the problem there is that immunohistic chemistry doesn't help you because it's going to be CK7 positive. Um, you're going to have to fall back on morphology uh, with the presence of um, a, a fibrotic or scirrus response uh, to the to the ductular structures. Uh, you're going to have to look at the morphology of the nuclei, the color of the nuclei. And then other features such as things like CA199, CEA, uh, um, and so on, yeah, can be a very difficult diagnosis. Amaladi, I see you've um, switched on your video. Any comments that you would like to share with us? Maybe unmute. I'm okay with the explanation and uh, we, I'm happy with the answers. No problem. Where you I'm from? fine. Thank you. Where I'm, you from? From, I'm from OETHC, Obafemi Aula Investigation Hospital. Nigeria. Yeah. Thank you very much you. and welcome. Thank you. So, Martin, just one other factor. Um, so, look, we've got a lot of clinical and radiological features that we use in prognosis, but perhaps are there any that you can share with us that you look for histologically that could perhaps give us a prognosis on hepatocellular carcinoma? So Chris, also, I mean, there, there, there have been lots of studies to, uh, to try and identify prognostic criteria for HCC. And I think the answer to those is that they're pretty few and far between. It used to be said, for example, that the clear cell variant of hepatocellular carcinoma uh, carried a, a worse prognosis compared to... Um, uh, compared to um, ordinary hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, I think before the days of transplantation and hepatectomy, uh, the average survival of patients with hepatocellular carcinoma was of the order of nine months. And I think that untreated still remains the same today. Um, it's, a, it's a dismal tumor to have. And in fact, I was just, just before the meeting uh, reading about fibrolamella carcinoma. And, um, you know, we all think that fibrolamella carcinoma carries a good prognosis. And maybe it does, but the literature, in fact, suggests otherwise. 
that the sort of five-year survival rate of uh, fibrolamella carcinoma is of the order of 50 to 60 percent. I don't have any any hard and fast facts and personal experience of that. They're relatively few and far between. But you know, we have this sort of idea that uh, fibrolamella is okay. Um, I think that the limited numbers of patients of fibrolamella carcinoma that I've seen that have been rebiopsied, in fact, they have survived for longer periods. Uh, you know, and certainly we've had rebiopsies come in sort of five years later, but that's following hepatectomy. Any comments or questions from anyone before we go on to the next case? And Bilal, any comments from you? Yes, please. Um, so uh, the Toronto criteria, uh, first published 2016 um, by uh, Gonzalo Sapashtan. I think, I'm not sure if I say that name correctly or not. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, he, he, he presented some really interesting stuff looking at uh, tumors out of Milan criteria. And, you know, very interestingly, looking at uh, biopsying some of these patients and looking at their uh, tumor-free survival. And what he found was that, you know, in terms of tumor biology, so a well-differentiated tumor with no, um, uh, well-differentiated differentiated tumor with no um, uh, vascular, uh, a perivascular invasion, microvascular invasion, uh, alpha feta protein of uh, ideally even less than 500, um, you know, would would offer better outcomes specifically when heading towards transplantation. So in that setting, the you know the the, the, the transplant uh, histology is is oh sorry the tumor histology um, certainly has a role to play in prognostication as well as therapy because then you can start talking about transplanting patients that are not necessarily within the Milan criteria um, uh, uh, and, and, and you know, even potentially even beyond UCSF as long as the uh, alpha feta protein is appropriate. Great. Should we go on to the next case? Dinan? Yes, Prof. Um... So Prof, the third case is a Mr. AJ, 34-year-old gentleman, um, has no significant comorbid illnesses of concern. Um, dad demised at age 40 from colorectal carcinoma, um, now presented with a two-month history of right flank pain, no significant weight loss, fevers, altered bowel habits, uh, didn't have any clinical features of chronic liver disease, had never had a screening endoscopy performed um, and was admitted for workup. But of concern on his imaging of his abdomen, um, he was found to have a 6.1 by six centimeter lesion, um, thought to be a likely HCC on initial imaging tests. However, all of his tumor markers were negative. Alpha fetoprotein was 1.7 at the time. CA, CA99 was 16. Had an absolutely normal liver function test and um, we elected to biopsy him. Um, this also due to the fact that on the review of his CT scan, he was found not to have typical early wash in and early wash out features of his lesion. Um, and the biopsy was then forwarded on to Prof Hale for review. Prof Hale? Yeah, okay, so thanks, Dylan. Do, do you want to show the, um, the, the radiology? Can you easily do that? I can try, Prof. Yeah, I apologies from Charles Saniki, our expert radiologist who couldn't make it this afternoon, but we are attempting to also incorporate radiology into these um, liver clinicopath sessions just to give the extra dimension, which I think is wonderful. I'm not going to be able to hide um, sensitive data while doing that. Okay. So I think you should just go ahead. Fine. Okay, so, 
So this was, uh, and still is, a very tricky biopsy. And I'm not sure that we've got all the answers. In fact, I'm fairly sure that we don't have all the answers yet. So what we've got is we've got two biopsies. And uh, the first is that um, um, I'm just sort of just, just backtracking. Yeah. So, so the first is we've got this biopsy here. And you can see just under low power examination uh, that the architecture of this biopsy is normal. There's a, a portal tract there uh, and uh, another portal tract and central vein over there. Got a couple of biopsies. And, and remember I said that, you know, if you've got a fragmented biopsy, it means that normal biopsies tend to hold themselves together. And this is an example of that, where you've got hepatic tissue, which is uh, well, uh, it's, it's surviving and it's, it's, it's in good shape. And if we look at the architecture, you can see that it is fine. We've got portal tract there, and uh, we've got a central vein. There's a central vein there. That looks okay. Another portal tract there. I think this is probably a central vein. Looks all right. There's no significant expansion of the portal tracts, and uh, there's. Um, uh, there's a little bit of bioductual perversion. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put on the reticulum stain. Don't worry too much about the dots. It's really just to, to give us uh, guidance as to which part of the biopsy we're looking at. But you can see that... Uh, for all intents and purposes, the architecture is maintained. Uh, for example, in this area here, I think you've got a portal tract, um, a, a portal tract is focuses, portal tract there, another portal tract there. You still got the trabecular reticulum framework uh, maintained. There's a little bit of condensation here and there. Um, the man, I think, is 38 or 35, as I recall. So there certainly is evidence of, of previous liver injury, um, but I don't think it has been permanent. I don't know if we look at the serious red. You can see that that picture is maintained. So we'll just clean this. Sorry about the scratches on the cover slip, but uh, you can see this, these areas of fibrosis, this increased collagen, that represents those areas, those foci of reticulum condensation that I showed you earlier on. So there's a little bit of fibrosis in the liver, but the architecture is fine. So we would report this out as a multifocal patchy sinusoidal fibrosis. So that was the first biopsy. And when we get to the second biopsy, the picture is completely different. Once again, notice that the biopsy itself seems to be holding together. But it's certainly a very busy looking biopsy. You can see that there are areas of blueness in this biopsy. You can see that the hepatocellular plates are somewhat thickened. But the important thing as well, remember, is to always look at the overall architecture of the biopsy. So for example, do you have retention of portal structures? And if you go through this, you can see that, for example, here, this is a portal tract. You can see bioductual proliferation. And, and Chris, you were asking about cholangiocarcinomas. And this is really a case in point because these, I think, are just proliferating bile ducts. Uh, there's a little bit of cellular pleomorphism, but there's a little bit of angulation, but you haven't got that sort of florid ductular proliferation that we saw in the other case. That there, I think, is probably another portal tract. 
I think you've got a bit of ductual proliferation taking place there. And I think this could be a hepatic arteriole. And as we go through this, you can see there, again, another portal tract. You can see the hepatic arteriole, you can see a bile duct there, and there's also bile ductal proliferation. This bile ductal proliferation is also looking quite, uh, uh, quite significant. And as we go through, same again, another portal tract. Now that is very useful because that tells us that what we're dealing with is that is not hepatocellular carcinoma, because you don't expect to find portal tracts in hepatocellular carcinoma. And this picture is replicated through the rest of the biopsy. You can see portal tract, I'll just go to leave my pointer. In fact, maybe I should just put my pointer. I'll leave that there. So that's another portal tract there, another portal tract, for example, there, and another portal tract here with a big hepatic arterial. So the portal tracts throughout this biopsy. If we look here, we can see another portal tract there, more hepatic tissue, another portal tract there, and so on, and another portal tract there. Now you wouldn't expect to see that in a paracellular carcinoma. The other thing that seems to be happening is we seem to have these rather, um, uh, what's the word? these nests of hepatocytes uh, that are showing uh, duplication. So this is twinning of hepatocytes. And then we've also got this inflammatory infiltrate that you see there. And those are lymphocytes. These are all lymphocytes. And those are mature lymphocytes. And then elsewhere in this biopsy, we've got a focus of quite florid lymphoid infiltration. And once again, just to point out where we are, notice that that's a hepatic arteriole. So this is a portal tract and you've got this dense lymphoid infiltrate. It looks as though it's mature. Those lymphocytes look mature. When you see this, you think to yourself, well, what is going on? Does this patient, for example, have a low grade lymphoma, for example, um, lymphocytic lymphoma, stroke leukemia. He is a bit young for that. That would be normally be found in a somewhat older population. But nevertheless, that goes through your mind. Could it be other things such as hepatitis C infection? All those things go to mind. And look at this infiltrate. You can see how it is actually separating or, or tracking between the uh, hepatocyte um, trabeculae. And you can see the twinning uh, of these uh, paracellular plates. You can see the duplication. Look at that there. You can see that you've got two, for example, in that cord there, you've got four hepatocyte nuclei. So twinning of hepatocyte plates is, is certainly there. But is it hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the question that we're being asked? And I must tell you that there is a difference of opinion. I think some of my colleagues think that it is hepatocellular carcinoma, and I can't come to that diagnosis. And the reason I can't come to that diagnosis is because I'm seeing portal tracts in amongst uh, this pathology. I don't know what this pathology is, having said that. Now, I said, for example, earlier on, that one of the problems with immunohistochemistry and special stains is to just make the problem a different color. And if we look, for example, at the glutamine synthetase, we will see that this is positive. I mean, that's pretty strong positivity, just like that previous hepatocellular carcinoma that I showed you. It's not present throughout the biopsy, but here, for example, you can see these strongly positive uh, cells that are staining up in between um, these, this lymphoid infiltrate. And then the glycoprime 3 is also positive. But I say positive in inverted commas because it looks peculiar. It doesn't look like a normal glycan 3 positivity. So for example, we've got this rather sort of dirty, patchy looking staining with glycan 3. Having said that though, I've seen HCCs uh, where, where one sees the sort of degree and, and sort of fuzziness of the, uh, of the glycan 3 positivity staining. So as I said, to me, this is just making the problem a different color. 
uh, the possibility does exist that this may, for example, represent a, fo a focal nodular hyperplasia, but in my heart of hearts, I can't call this HCC. Mm. So, Dinan, yeah, over to you. Dif difficult case. And, you know, we sit and we sweat blood over these cases. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and, yeah, it's, it, it is really, I mean, I've been looking at this case now for close on three weeks. And I still have not made up my mind. And in fact, I think if oh. I was to, and I do need to send out a report, uh, but we've discussed it on a number of occasions. And um, yeah, I think the closest I can probably get to is, as as Charles and Nika said, maybe this could be an inflammatory variant of a, of a focal nodular hyperplasia. But bottom line, he actually needs a rebiopsy. Thanks, Dylan. So, Prof, I think we've got a couple of minutes left, and just on this last case, uh, maybe is it, we should there is open another the floor. question. Uh, sorry, before you go, Dinan, um, there, is, there is another question, um, uh, Martin, um, from Omaladi. So please, uh, apologies for my pronunciation. This time from um, from Omaladi Adegoki. Um, so not the same Omaladi from. The first question, but uh, she asks whether um, you ever use albumin um, in situ in situ hybridization. I assume that's what ISH is uh, in diagnosing cholangiocarcinoma, and if so, what's your experience? So the answer is no, we don't use it. Um, it's not not an investigation we've put in. Thanks. Okay, Dinan. So just for a minute or two, maybe we should open the floor to see if anybody's got any ideas on that last case. And mm. then we'll go through what our game plan is um, going forward. Uh, guys, just unmute yourself and let us know. Denon, if I may, go for Hello. it. Um, okay. the... Can I go on? Uh, okay, go for it. Yes. Okay. I want to. Is that time that you find it difficult to? Um, Okay, maybe you may not find it because anyway, that to differentiate between hepatocellular carcinoma and uh, uh, adenoma, hepatic adenoma. Because there was a case that we saw in our center that we, I saw, I shared with some people, they said I should go ahead to do some ISC, which I am not privileged to do and the patient cannot afford it. In that case, what do you, what do you do? So, so, Martin, will you repeat the question? Yes, so, so I think if I understood the question uh, okay. correctly, to distinguish a paracellular adenoma from, um, from a paracellular carcinoma. So I think the first thing is obviously history. Um, so you need to make sure, well, try and ascertain, you know, the actual clinical profile of the patient. Uh, for example, hepatocellular adenomas, as we know, are, are typically found in women, uh, often taking hormonal, hormonal therapy of, uh, of some sort. Uh, bearing in mind, it's not always women. Uh, sometimes it's uh, men who are taking uh, hormones, steroids, for example, bodybuilders. Um, you know, I always say that you, you have to ask the, the hard questions in order to get the uh, try and attempt to get the you know the pathology right because if you don't ask those hard questions um you you can be you can be misled so so the history is important the next is uh, the actual presentation is it a solitary lesion is it a multiple lesion is there necrosis or no necrosis macroscopically and for that matter microscopically and then having looked at that the next the next stain to look at the first stain is the reticulum uh, because in a paracellular carcinoma, if you are lucky, 
uh, there'll be no, um, no reticulum. And I often recite a case that I saw many years ago, long before the advent of immunohistochemistry. And this is a liver biopsy that uh, I looked at at Barra. And um, I looked down this liver biopsy, and to me, it was perfectly normal from one end to the other. And uh, I then looked at the reticulum, and you must always look at the reticulum. Never, never ignore the reticulum. And uh, there on the reticulum stain, there was as though a mouse had taken a bite out of the biopsy. And what that mouse had done, in fact, that was actually an absence or paucity of reticulum. And that was a, an HCC that had just crept into the edge of the biopsy. And uh, by going back to the HCC, you, you could see it, but only just. And it was a well-differentiated paracellular carcinoma. So the reticulum is your, is your best friend when it comes to that. As far as immunohistochemistry is concerned, very difficult. If you've got glutamine synthetase positivity, if you've got gly, uh, glycan 3 positivity, those are two good stains. And uh, the other one is aromatase, if, if you've got it as well. Um, so I would, I would suggest if you haven't got those, uh, to, to get those. But yet it can be very difficult. And you sometimes may have to ask for a, a repeat biopsy. Things like alpha feta protein, for example, is that elevated? So, you know, histopathology is always a summation of, of everything. It's, you don't always have all the answers, but you've got to take everything into account. Excellent. Time's running out. Um, so perhaps, Bilal, your comments on the case and then uh, Dinan to summarize or end. Yeah. Um... Um, uh, you know, uh, as as Prof Hale said, this is um, this is this is a diagnosis that uh, uh, is is more than likely causing quite considerable emotional angst with the um, uh, with the patient, and and we're looking forward to uh, getting answers with the second biopsy. Um, uh, it's it's also potentially now that it's it's a full month down the line. You know, perhaps will give us a little bit more information on further imaging uh, at the same time. So that's 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 the intention here. I think I think um, the the place of multiple eyes, multiple clinicians working together in a multidisciplinary team um, certainly is highlighted in this case, where there is significant discussion towards getting. <laughs> Okay, I'll mute you. Uh, Mimini, will you will you will you mute, please? Okay. Hi, Mumini, Rashid, would you mind muting, please? Thank you. Um, so, yeah, just 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 focusing on the value of a multidisciplinary team effort, getting the best answer for uh, for the patient, um, and 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 you know, especially highlighting the critical role that the pathologist serves uh, in that in the, in that uh, in that process. So, yeah, hopefully we'll have an update for you guys soon on 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 what happens with the uh, uh, repeat investigation on this gentleman. Um, Dinan, are you uh, any further comments from you? No, I'm good. Uh, I think we're a couple of minutes past half past five. I'd just like to thank the Project Echo, uh, the Echo India team, the Gastro Foundation, and a huge thanks to Professor Martin Hare, Professor Cassimides, uh, for bringing these meetings together. And um, thanks to the sponsors. And I think next week we have endoscopy. Yeah, so and next week, uh, so, so next week, so it's 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 a talk on biliary stenting, which will be Mark Banhon by the the UCT group, Ed Jonas, and I think Jay Crick is coming on board too. So look nice. forward to that. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye, bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Bye.